Deputy Speaker, sir, I rise today to discuss how we can build Parliament into a fairer arena for all. During the debate on the President's address, there was much discussion of how opposition parliamentarians behave and performed in Parliament. DPM Lawrence Wong openly called on the opposition to offer a serious alternative agenda and noted that as Singapore develops into a matured democracy, it needs both a serious government and a serious opposition. The question then is whether the current parliamentary structures and processes support the work of a serious opposition. Since the last general election, the government has taken steps to recognise the opposition in our parliament with the appointment of Mr Pritam Singh, the Honourable Member of Arjuni GRC and Leader of the Workers' Party. As Leader of the Opposition and the provision of some resources to assist him to discharge his duties. While the PSP supports this move, we think that these steps are insufficient to recognise the opposition, opposition's role in our political system. The government can definitely do more to encourage a serious opposition that is an integral part of a matured parliamentary democracy. Both the government and the opposition must play their part. Ministers have discussed at length what the government wants a serious opposition to do. Let us also discuss what a serious government should do to strengthen our parliamentary system. I entered parliament in August 2020. Since then, I have learned a lot more about the processes and procedures of parliament and participated in many lively and substantive debates. Based on my personal experiences, some parliamentary processes may not be the most conducive to facilitate MPs, including those from the ruling party, to do their jobs. Allow me to quote three examples here. Firstly, MPs are supposed to scrutinise the government and hold it, account, hold it to account to ensure that it is acting in the best interest of Singaporeans, be it legislation, policy or executive action. Many MPs from both sides of the House do not come from a public policy or legal background and may require assistance to do such work. However, while there's a library in the Parliament and the librarians are very helpful, there is no other research support. In place of that, elected MPs are provided with a monthly allowance of $1,300 to hire a legislative assistant and $500 for a secretarial assistant to assist them. I'm sure most members would agree with me that this is meagre and is completely insufficient to hire even one full-time assistant. Obviously, the government only wants MP to be supported by volunteers. Furthermore, after 1997, only elected MPs are provided an allowance for the purpose of hiring a legislative assistant and secretary assistant to support them. The NCMPs and NMPs do not receive such an allowance. Then Leader of the House, Mr Wang Kang Sing's justification for the removal 
of the NCMP support allowances were that the duties of NCMPs were not as heavy and onerous as those of elect elected MPs, as only elected MPs sit on committees. Today, NCMPs have full voting rights equal to elected MPs and sit on the parliamentary committees. I sit on the public petitions committee and the parliamentary workload has increased across the board, commensurate with the increasing complexity of our civil service and our parliamentary system. The second observation, MPs could contribute more meaningfully to debates if the government provides ministerial statements and other speeches to MPs, and MPs provided ministers with drafts of their speeches beforehand. This will be a win-win situation for all, as it enables MPs and ministers to debate on the substantive issues and further the discussion instead of having to divine whether the questions has been answered by the ministerial statement. The ultimate objective of the debates in this parliament are to arrive at the best policy for Singaporeans, not to win a parliamentary debate. In that spirit, I provided this a German motion speech to the Speaker and the Leader of the House prior to today's delivery. I hope this has enabled the government to prepare a more substantive response to the issues and suggestions that I raised in this speech. The third observation, MPs could benefit from more flexibility around timekeeping, especially when it comes to question time or the Committee of Supply debates. Timekeeping may be important to keep our processes efficient, but I think more parliamentary time should be provided to ensure that every member who wants to ask a question can do so. This is especially true during the COS, where many members have been unable to ask supplementary questions because of the guillotine time and billions of dollars of expenditure are just approved like that. Having more substantive debates on policy will go a long way to enable Singaporeans to become better informed on public policy and make the government more accountable. Flowing from my observations above, I have several suggestions for improvement which fall into three major groups. The first group is aimed at better supporting MPs in carrying out their legislative duties. One, the Parliament Secretariat should be given resources to set up a research department. This department should have a head and several full-time staffers to provide sub research support for MPs as they scrutinize bills and policies. I think an appropriate annual starting budget for such a department is around $1 million. Two, the allowance to hire legislative assistants and secretary assistants should be increased and extended to NCMPs and NMPs. It is timely for the government to review the legislative assistance scheme for NCMPs and NMPs, as it promised to do so in 1997. Three, the government to provide all data requested by members in the requested format, unless there are national security or financial market sensitivities consideration. The government should not use the risk of such data being misinterpreted or being used for other purposes as justification for not releasing it. Once again, 
a, fair, a fair arena for all. The second group of suggestions is aimed at providing MPs with more time to question the government and to discharge their duties as legislators. One, we should introduce an opposition hour during the first day of every parliamentary sitting to discuss subjects chosen by the opposition. These are likely to cover current topics which have, which have the most public interest. This is not new and is done in other Westminster parliaments, such as the UK and Canada. For example, in the UK, the leader of the opposition has 17 days where he can select the topics for debate. These debates cover a wide range of issues, from government policy to current events. This also provides a platform for the opposition to hold the, the government to account, challenge its policies and decisions, and propose alternative policies or solutions to issues facing the country. Two, in principle, the Q&A and clarification time for all debates, including PQs, ministerial statements, bills and motions in this House, should not end as long as there are new substantive questions from MPs. This will allow debates to conclude substantively. The Speaker obviously would still have the discretion to end the debate if he is of the view that further questions being asked by MPs are not covering new substantive ground. The third group of recommendation is aimed at strengthening the role of the opposition in our parliamentary system. One, the Public Accounts Committee, PAC, should be chaired by an opposition MP, with MPs from all political parties represented on the committee. The PAC's role is to scrutinize government's financial performance and use of public funds. As such, it is important that the PAC is seen as independent and impartial. Many Westminster parliaments ensure this by having an opposition MP chairing the PAC. This was also the case in Singapore until 1968, when there were no more opposition, opposition MPs in Parliament. The first PAC chairman under a PAP government in 1959 was A.P. Raja, who was an independent. The second was Mr. Lim Huan Boon, who was from the Barisan Socialist. As it has been over 40 years since opposition MPs returned to this House, I believe it is timely to again embrace our parliamentary convention of having an opposition MP chairing the PAC. Two, the Public Petitions Committee, PPC, should also be chaired by an opposition MP. The PPC plays an important role in providing a platform for citizens to voice their concerns and grievances to the government. It is therefore crucial that the PPC is seen as objective and non-partisan, and having an opposition MP as a, chair, as a chairperson can help to ensure this. In the United Kingdom, there is no rule for the petitions committee must be chaired by an opposition MP, but this is currently the case. In conclusion, Deputy Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition has on many occasions emphasised that a small number of opposition MPs is far from the one-third necessary to check the PAP's parliamentary supermajority. What we are asking for is a fair arena for all.
and access to data and resources. The opposition lacks access to the resources of our excellent civil service. Handicapped by this lack of resources, alternative policies created by the opposition will not have the same breadth and depth of the government. The PSP echoes the views of the leader of the opposition. I've made many suggestions that will enable us to better discharge our duties as opposition MPs and NC MPs to Singaporeans. I urge the government to seriously consider these suggestions. The government must pay more attention to discussing serious alternative policies with us and spend less time deflecting and avoiding uncomfortable questions. On our part, we will continue to do our best to discharge our duties as a rational and responsible opposition party in Parliament. This House comprises of both the government and the opposition. If this is to be a first-class parliament that works amicably and constructively for the good of Singapore, it must be a fair arena for all. Singaporeans deserve better for country, for people. Mr Deputy Speaker, I thank the member for his speech and suggestions. I also thank him for providing his speech in advance a departure from his norm in respect of his more recent adjournment motions and motions, but quite understandable given his proposal and well appreciated. <coughs> Mr Leong has put forward four proposals. First, to provide additional resources for MPs, NCMPs and NMPs. Second, to provide ministerial speeches in advance and opportunities for opposition to raise matters. Third, more flexibility in timekeeping. And fourth, chairmanship of certain select committees. Let me address each of these in turn. First, on the issue of resources for members, this is something that we review from time to time. On this, there are two separate points, namely the difference between the allowances for elected MPs and NCMPs or NMPs, and the quantum of the allowances for hiring legislative and secretarial assistants. On the first point, NCMPs have the same voting rights as MPs in Parliament, but it is indisputable that their workload is less than that of elected MPs, and they do not have the responsibility for a specific constituency or for dealing with MPS cases of residents. As such, in principle, it is reasonable to differentiate between the support the elected MPs and NCMPs receive. On the second, in terms of the allowances given to elected MPs, whether it be the general allowance or the allowances for hiring a legislative assistance, the LA, and a secretarial assistance, we do not differentiate between PAP MPs and opposition MPs. The amount given to elected PAP MPs and the elected opposition MPs is exactly the same, which is fair. The PAP backbenchers make do with exactly the same allowances as the elected WP MPs, safe for the leader of the opposition, or the LO. In the case of the LO, having regard to the greater opposition presence in Parliament after the last general election and the designation of Mr Singh as leader of the opposition for this Parliament, it was appropriate to allocate more resources to him given his expanded duties and responsibilities. I also wish to highlight that the Leader of the Opposition gets more resources than the PAP backbenchers and the PAP GPC chairpersons. However, this is fair, given his role. This is an example of how we review and adjust according to the circumstances. Mr Leung has called for a research department to support all MPs, costing $1 million for a start. His justification is that, and I quote, many MPs from both sides of the House do not come from a public policy or legal background and may require assistance to do such work." Close quotes. While many PAP MPs do not come from such backgrounds either, they are not asking for this. They have been able to work within the allowances currently allocated to them. They also often pool 
their LA allowances to hire full-time legislative and or secretarial assistants to support two or more MPs. They do not confine themselves to the legislative assistant allowance, but often also draw upon their MPs' allowance to top up the sum. It is quite open to opposition MPs and NCMPs to do the same. What is of note, however, is that the absence of such research facilities has not in any way deterred the PSP from asserting its ability to advance policy positions. In PSP's 2020 manifesto, they said that the government's response to the economy was, I quote, a patchwork of policy tweaks without addressing the fundamental factors affecting Singaporeans, close quotes. And what was needed was, quote, a paradigm shift and to, quote, look for workable alternative solutions going forward. They said, and I quote again, Progress Singapore Party's manifesto offers a better alternative to the current problems that we are facing as a nation, close quotes. And their manifesto refers to various economic, social, and political policies. Today, though, Mr. Leung espouses the view that the opposition lacks access to the resources of our excellent civil service. Handicapped by these lack of resources, alternative policies created by the opposition will not have the same breadth and depth of the government's. That was his statement earlier. There is a marked contrast between the statements in PSP's manifesto and Mr. Leung's statements in Parliament today. We do have an excellent civil service. However, Mr. Leung's assertion misses the point. The civil service works with the elected government of the day. Ultimately, it is the ministers who decide on the government's agenda and set the major direction of policies being implemented. These policies are not presented by the civil service fully formed, with all the ministers having to do is simply read out the policy speech in parliament. Ministers provide political guidance to the civil service to deliver results, and the ministers have to take responsibility for the same. If Mr. Leung needs more information, he can obtain those through PQs and during COS cuts, and he has done so. At the end of the day, the key to better debate in Parliament lies in understanding the main issues at hand, acknowledging our fundamental realities and constraints, and taking not just the easy decisions, but also the hard ones. It is not through making unending requests for ever more detailed data, which are then used as an alibi for not offering more constructive ideas or better alternative policies during debates. In reality, we actually provide more data than most countries. During the last session of Parliament, more than 7,000 parliamentary questions or PQs were filed. And most answers would have involved the provision of data in some form or another. Mr. Leung says the government must provide data in whatever format MPs want. I ask Mr. Leung and members to bear in mind that data collation, as well as slicing and dicing it in different ways, and the need to check the data thereafter, cost time, money, and effort. We will lean forward to provide what is reasonable and practicable, but we cannot fulfill every whim. Minister Tan Si Ling explained this at an earlier sitting. Next, Mr. Leung requests that ministers provide their speeches to MPs in advance. In exchange, she proposed MPs provide drafts only of their speeches beforehand. Mr. Leung says this enables substantive debate. The reality is that the system is designed such that MPs can always engage and debate the ministers, irrespective of when the minister's speech is delivered. The budget statement is delivered at least a week before the budget debate and COS, so MPs have ample opportunity to, cut through the, to think through their speeches and cuts. Bills are introduced during prior sittings, except in cases of urgency, which are rare. Hence, in general, MPs have about a month to go through the bill, which forms the basis of the minister's second reading speech. Ministerial statements are generally of two kinds, 
First, those with strong public interests, where multiple PQs have been filed, and those addressing important matters which have to be dealt with expeditiously and at short notice, or are not suitable to be dealt with under other mechanisms. MPs can seek clarifications from the Minister on the Ministerial Statement. Policy speeches delivered outside of Parliament, which are publicly reported. MPs have enough time to go through these and raise issues in Parliament. In most of these situations, MPs have more than ample opportunity to engage the ministers on their speeches through a wide array of mechanisms, PQs, supplementary PQs, motions, bills, adjournment motions, clarifications, and COS cuts. In fact, if anything, the advantage is with the MPs because most of these mechanisms are not time-bound. MPs may deploy these days, weeks, months, and sometimes even years after the minister's speech was delivered as Mr. Leong himself has done, for example, on manpower issues. Of course, there may be instances where notice is not possible, for example, when the minister is responding in the course of an ongoing debate, or market-sensitive matters such as tax announcements. But what is possible is to ensure that there is enough time for MPs to digest what has been said, respond, and then have an informed substantive debate. This, the parliamentary procedure allows. For this same reason, there is no need to have an opposition hour. This is because every sitting is an opportunity for MPs, whether PAP or opposition, to raise topics of their choice and to hold the government to account, challenge policies and decisions, and propose alternative policies through these mechanisms. They can do this through PQs, moving full motions for debates, as NMPs are doing in this sitting, or moving adjournment motions, as Mr. Leong is doing today. This is already taking place. Mr. Leong's next proposal is, in effect, that there should be unlimited time, uh, unlimited time for PQs and COS cuts. While I can understand why, from his point of view, he would like that, this would not be a good idea. It would be the surest way of triggering Parkinson's law, the adage that work will expand to fill the time allotted for its completion. We have already seen that happen with PQs. The time for PQs has increased considerably, given more sittings. However, instead of allowing us to deal with more PQs, it has resulted in more and often repetitive SPQs on the same topic. Where flexibility is required, Mr. Speaker has exercised his discretion to allow it. For exam examples being the extension of time to enable supplementary questions on HDB's ethnic integration policy and on Keppel Offshore Marine. Parliament time is finite and questions and debates cannot go on without end. Setting time limits ensures that questions stay focused, answers stay on point, and more can be accomplished. In fact, in the UK Parliament, question time is only one hour per sitting day, inclusive of Prime Minister's questions, and they have 650 MPs. Finally, Mr Leung has called for the Public Accounts Committee, PAC, and the Public Petitions Committee, PPC, to be chaired by an opposition MP, on the basis that doing so will ensure that they are independent, impartial, objective, and non-partisan. Let us reflect for a moment and ask if we really think that will be the case. The better solution is the one that we already have in place under the rules. The PAC and the PPC are standing select committees. A select committee is a committee of parliament. The SOs provide that the composition of each standing select committee should reflect the balance between the government benches and the opposition benches in Parliament. And if you think about it for a moment, that is fair, because it reflects the proportion of government and opposition MPs. The SOs provide that the Speaker chairs the PPC, which is again fair, because he chairs the whole Parliament, a position to which he was elected by Parliament at the beginning of the term. And the Parliament which elected him was in turn elected by the people who also decided the proportion of PAP MPs and opposition MPs. Speaker appoints the chair of the PAC, an authority conferred on him by Parliament through the standing orders, and that is also fair because it gives flexibility to choose an appropriate chair having regard to the technical content involved. Mr Deputy Speaker, I'll just take half a minute to complete. Hence, the chairmanship of the select committees is drawn from the authority of the people and we should respect that. In any case, opposition members serve on the select committees and are entitled to ask questions and argue issues fully. There is no reason to think that they have not done their job properly. 
In conclusion, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the rules afford more than enough opportunity for MPs, opposition or otherwise, to hold the government to account, raise queries and debate matters. The real issue is how to do this effectively. The answer lies not in changing the rules, but rather for MPs to develop the skills of listening, using the existing rules more effectively to make a contribution to the debate and show that they are deserving of the trust that voters place in them.